issue emergency authorization for the Pfizer vaccine tonight. That could mean shots in arms as soon as Monday. That should be cause for celebration, right? Maybe a pat on the back for the, F- for the FDA Commissioner Stephen Hahn? Nope, not in this administration. Multiple media outlets are now reporting that the White House Chief of Staff, Mark Meadows, told Hahn to submit his resignation if his agency doesn't approve the vaccine by the end of the day. We should note that Dr. Hahn has denied that reporting, calling it an untrue representation of the phone call with the Chief of Staff. But there is no denying a tweet from the president this morning in which he told Hahn to, quote, get the damn vaccines out now. The Times reports that because of the pressure, regulators are now racing to complete a fact sheet, information for physicians and other documents that go along with that authorization. Right, because that's what we need right now. Rushed fact sheets and information for physicians. And for what? People familiar with the FDA's decision and situation say the timing of the announcement is unlikely to speed up the shipment of the initial doses. Since the beginning of this pandemic, when faced with the option of doing the right thing or the wrong thing, this administration chose the latter over and over again. When the choice was between doing the right thing and doing nothing, they chose the latter over and over again. You know, like they did at the beginning of the pandemic when nurses were wearing trash bags and begging for more PPE. And now when we actually need this administration to do nothing, to just butt out, They can't do it. Instead, they insist on meddling in a process that's gone right without any of their help so that they can take the credit without shouldering any of the responsibility of the unimaginable loss we've seen in 2020. And starting us off tonight, Dr. Anne Ramoyne. She's an epidemiologist and a professor at the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health and Andy Slavitt. He's the former acting administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and the host of the podcast In the Bubble, which is a title that I very much like and feel is very, very on the nose for this time. Andy, I have to start with you here. Uh, This vaccine has been developed and reviewed in record time. And the Trump administration has decided that right now is the time to start the pressure campaign on the FDA. What is your reaction to what they're doing here and what could the potential consequences be? Well, Zerlina, really, I, I couldn't agree more with your opening remarks. Uh, first of all, uh, let's start with the big picture. Uh, these are great vaccines um, with terrific data, and the American public um, should not be sidetracked by these uh, political sideshows uh, into being concerned. The, this vaccine that we're going to approve here in the U.S. was already approved in the U.K. without any of the Trump pressure. So I don't want this to interfere with people's concerns because there's no reason to add to that. At the same time, you're exactly right. There, there's, you know, unless President Trump has some kind of scientific degree that we don't know about, um, this is not his place. His place is to listen to the scientists, be patient, uh, spend a day or two, uh, make sure that all the arguments are had, and let the experts debate this. It was public on C-SPAN. This is exactly as it should be because the public wants to know that the vaccines that we're going to be putting in our bodies are ones that have had no political interference. interference. And I think we'll be able to assure that, but he's not helping. I feel like them interfering with factual sheet, like fact sheets and factual information that's going to go out to the public is like, that should be a cause for alarm. Dr. Ramoyne, we mentioned the fact that because of this pressure, FDA regulators are now rushing on, rushing the paperwork on this approval process. Does that concern you at all? Well, I think we really have to understand what that means, that they're rushing the the process. Are they, you know, this process has been just really a model process since we started having the committee meetings. You know, they are taking their time. They are working carefully. You know, if they are if they are rushing some some, you know, uh, uh, proofreading some some documents, that's one thing. But I, do, I, I, am, I am pretty certain that that is a, probably a misclassification of what's actually happening here. The FDA has taken a stance 
of total transparency, of openness. We've just seen, we've just witnessed a really historic event of watching the, um, the committee, the advisory committee go through meticulously all this information. So any kind of pressure put on by the Trump administration is going to be, whether true or false, is really damaging and really inappropriate. You know, any vaccine campaign now, any any rollout of vaccines is going to be predicated on public trust at this point. And any erosion of public trust is absolutely the opposite of what we need to be doing. We need to be spending what we should have been doing for the last year is really promoting vaccines and just vaccines in general so people can understand the process, understand all the success of successful, safe, effective vaccines and all the things that are going to come forward. So I would think that the thing to be focusing on now is how do we address the concerns of the population that we have here? I've just been running a study on uh, vaccine acceptance, hesitancy in health workers in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And we know as of September, October, when our last survey was completed, uh, we had 66% of the healthcare workers having some concern. It was not that they were hesitant about vaccines in general. They were worried about this process in particular. They were worried about the politicization of the process. They were worried about the name warp speed and what that might entail. They were worried about the lack of information. So we are really at a point where healthcare workers are about to get these vaccines and we need to be doing everything we can to get them the information and to keep doubling down on the fact that this is a transparent process, that this all data that we have seen have, have been really excellent to date and it's not the end. There's going to be surveillance for a long time here. So I think that that is what we need to be focusing on and not this, you know, pressuring the FDA to finish something in 12 hours versus 48 hours. That makes no difference whatsoever. Yeah. And it's like, what is the rush? I mean, there was like weeks and weeks of golfing, you know, since the election. And I just don't understand why now they're so concerned with it being it happens to happen right now so that we can come out, I don't know, and cut a ribbon, a red proverbial ribbon the way he does in real estate. Uh, Andy, uh, to the point, uh, the, the U.S. recorded more than 3,000 deaths yesterday. I mean, that's just like a number that I still can't wrap my mind around. We all know that that's, that's above the number of people we lost on 9-11. Um, and that was for the second day in a row. Um, and CDC Director Robert Redfield is issuing a sober prediction about the weeks and months ahead. I want us to take a look at that and get your reaction on the other side. Probably for the next... 60 to 90 days, we're going to have more deaths per day than we had in 9-11 or we had in Pearl Harbor. Do you agree with that projection? It's pretty sobering. Well, I talked to some um, public health officials today, some local public health officials today, and they're talking now about what they're referring to as the Thanksgiving surge, which is usually when I eat too much during Thanksgiving, but apparently they meant something different. Um, and it's not welcome on top of what we're currently facing. If you're, if you're um, a healthcare worker, a doctor, a nurse, and you've been working uh, nonstop shifts um, in really terrifying conditions, the idea of seeing another surge on top of what we're seeing is almost too difficult to imagine. But doctors are telling me, and I'm sure they're telling others, that when they, when they are seeing people in the hospital, they're telling them that indeed um, they have been with their family uh, they thought it was okay during Thanksgiving. And so as bad as things are, they can get worse. What I don't want to do is predict beyond the next several weeks because everything that happens beyond a few weeks from now is within our control today. And we always have to keep in mind that we can always save the next life. Um, for every life we've lost, we've got to dedicate ourselves to doing everything we can for the next life and the next life because there are so many people that are still there sitting, whether they're sitting in nursing homes or sitting in their family homes. Um, they're, they're just doing whatever they're doing. And life is a lot less safe today than it once was. And we can do what we can because we are only talking in, about weeks and months, um, really, of having folks um, adjust their lives. And I know we can do this. I don't know it because we've done it, because we don't have a lot of good evidence. But I know that we can do it. Um, and if we do do it, we can, we can do we it. Can impact some of those projections. Yeah, I think I think we can do it, and I believe in us. Uh, Dr. Ramoyne, in the last minute here, uh, last night we talked to Dr. Celine Gounder, and she said something that stood out to me because it was new information I hadn't uh, that hadn't occurred to me about the vaccine, which is that 
even if you get vaccinated, you should still be wearing a mask afterwards. Do you agree with that? And, and why is that? I absolutely agree with Celine Gounder. She's, she's spot on. Here's the deal. What we know so far about this vaccine is that it's preventing symptomatic disease and severe disease. And that's really important. What we don't know is if it prevents asymptomatic infection. So if, you, if it doesn't prevent asymptomatic infection, you could get the vaccine, you're not gonna feel sick, get sick, but you may still be able to pass it on to other people. And so that's why we still need to wear masks. We just don't have the answer. And I think that this is really important to underscore here. We don't know yet. We're gonna learn a lot of things in the mm -hmm. days to come about this vaccine and the other, the you know how well it works in these situations. What we know now, severe disease and symptomatic disease, it's preventing, but we don't know about asymptomatic. So wear that mask. You still have to social distance, but with this vaccine, we're going to see, um, we will see mortality rates decrease. We're going to see morbidity. We're going to see people getting mm -hmm. sick. Those rates decrease. And that is a win. That is a win. Dr. Anne Ramoyne and Andy Slavitt, thank you to you both. And thank you for breaking all of that down. Stay safe. While the latest vaccine news is exciting, enormous challenges lie ahead. It is going to be like a game of Tetris, as each state and the District of Columbia are set to get only 2.9 million doses of the Pfizer vaccine in the initial shipment, and another 2.9 million three weeks after that. Most states are planning to begin with doctors, nurses, and other healthcare workers, but each state's vaccination plan is different. And then, what happens when the FDA approves the Moderna vaccine? Moderna has not given state immunization managers precise numbers on how many doses they'll receive. According to the executive director of the Association of Immunization Managers, quote, they have to factor in what their allocation is and what their allocation is going to be. It's kind of like a chess game, making six moves in advance to get where they need to be. Whether it's Tetris or whether it's chess, we know it's going to be hard. And joining me now is the mayor of Dayton, Ohio, Nan Whaley. Some parts of Ohio, uh, Mayor Whaley, are set to receive the Pfizer vaccine as early as December 15th. And assuming the FDA gives Moderna approval, Dayton will receive doses of vac vaccine by December the 22nd. This is all good news. What does the planning process look like right now to distribute the vaccine to frontline workers there? Well, we are prepared and ready for this uh, new challenge. As I was on the phone with other mayors across the country, I said the work of passing the vaccine through our community is something that we are very excited to do. It's the beginning of the end of the pandemic, and we've been planning uh, for the vaccine distribution since around May or June. Uh, Dayton is no stranger to crises, and certainly um, we work really well with the entire region here and are ready to go. After frontline workers uh, receive the vaccine, you're planning to give vaccines to people in long-term care facilities, very vulnerable uh, elderly folks um, and others. Uh, but who comes after that? After the 1A, Group 1A is what we call healthcare workers and folks in nursing homes. Next are first responders, police and firefighters. And then after that are folks that are older and have uh, pre-existing conditions. And so that will take, I think, a good, a good part of the next batch. Someone like me is at the very tail end of the overall list, which is fine. Uh, because, you know, for me, I, I'm most excited about people like my parents who have pre-existing conditions getting a hold of this vaccine uh, because they are so much more susceptible to severe symptoms with the virus. When you start giving it to those folks who aren't in hospitals or in long-term care um, after first-line responders, um, police officers, and EMS, um, how are you going to provide transportation for those folks who may have pre-existing conditions, as you said, but um, they can't get to where the vaccine is being distributed? How are those folks supposed to get vaccinated? Well, certainly we're talking about these pods that we've done before with vaccination on a much smaller scale across the county. And, you know, one of the key parts for me has been a place that doesn't necessarily have, you know, neighborhoods that don't have CVS or Walgreens, 
making sure that public health has spaces that are easily acceptable for uh, accessible for those areas in our community. Uh, that's going to rely again on public health. We're actually moving all of our public health workers to these pods every week, even though we don't know when the vaccine is coming in, just so we are prepared to be able to move every single drop of this vaccine, particularly in our hard to reach places. One of the things that I've really been pushing is making sure, I know we want this vaccine to be uh, accessible and easy, just like we get the flu shot, like at a CVS or Walgreens, but we really have to make sure that we're leaning into those hard to reach places in urban communities and in rural areas. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, I think, the really tough work, but important work and necessary and will be done by public health. How are you going to assure uh, your residents that, you know, the long term impacts or potential long term side effects of the vaccine? I mean, obviously, scientists are going to give all of the leaders that information, but how are you going to I don't know, make the, those who are nervous uh, among your residents feel more confident uh, in, in the safety and effectiveness of this vaccine? This is a super important question, right? So, you know, what we have been doing since the beginning of the COVID virus, for example, is really communicating with leaders on the ground. So, for example, every Friday morning, which was this morning, I have a call with the clergy at 8.30 a.m. And any clergy members can get on, public health gets on. And, you know, we really talk about where we are with the disease, which is pretty tough right now, asking them to really push on people staying at home, following the stay at home advisory, et cetera. And, you know, clergy do talk to people that are actually more susceptible to extreme symptoms because, you know, uh, parishes and, and clergy areas are, are older folks, right, that go to church. So last Friday, for example, public health came on and said, ask any question you have about the, about the vaccine. And we're going to take all those questions in. We'll answer right away the questions that we know the answers to. And the answers we don't know right now, we will get back to you. And I think that's what we're really trying to do is, you know, finding these community leaders that talk to a lot of folks uh, to really be validators and be transparent. For example, we don't know uh, the long term effects of this of this vaccine, just like we don't know the long term effects of getting COVID because it's been around us so short. So being mm -hmm. honest, being transparent and having those validators like clergy members, like nurses and doctors and folks that have a lot of friends, frankly, that have really big social networks. Uh, you know, n get the answers they need and deserve. And that means everything from going on, you know, social media and answering every question uh, to, to reaching in places with uh, different vo voices um, across the community and just being as transparent as op and open as possible. And I think that will be very key for us to, you know, really break any sort of misconceptions, but be honest about what we do know and don't know about this vaccine. Transparency is so important and having uh, members of the clergy be the messengers to people in the community is so essential um, because, you know, you want to get that information from somebody you know and trust. Mayor Nan Whaley, thank you so much uh, for being here and stay safe. Coming up, debating the death penalty as the Trump administration gives the go ahead for another execution. More on the disturbing trend Trump's last week's during Trump's last weeks in office when we return in 60 seconds. The pandemic is killing so many Americans, you'd think we would want to avoid any more preventable deaths. But no, the Trump administration is on an unprecedented spree of federal executions before the president leaves office. Five executions were scheduled from December up until the week before Joe Biden's inauguration. 
four are black men. The fifth would be the first woman executed by the federal government in nearly 70 years. One of the men, Brandon Bernard, was executed just yesterday. He was only 18 years old when a young couple was robbed and murdered in Texas. One person in the group shot the couple, and Bernard set their car on fire. The prosecution said one of the victims died in the fire. Bernard's lawyers disputed this and said he was just an accomplice. The fact that Brandon was both youthful and an accomplice, I think those are really potent reasons that support mercy in this case. For 20 years, attorney Rob Owen has fought to get Brandon Bernard off of death row. The jury was 11 whites and one African-American member. Uh, the crime involved a group of black teenagers committing a crime against two white victims. Those are dynamics which historically have been associated with uh, pressure to return a death sentence. A Trump ally, attorney Alan Dershowitz, was among the many people who asked Bernard's, that Bernard's execution be delayed, but the Supreme Court said no. Another black man, Alfred Brugeau, was set to be executed this evening. Why the rush of executions? Maybe Trump wants this to be a part of his legacy. Remember, in 1989, he took out a full-page ad calling for New York to bring back the death penalty for five black teenagers known as, well, now known as the Exonerated Five, then known as the Central Park Five. Of course, they were all since exonerated. One of those five is with us today, Yusuf Salam, who co-authored the book Punching the Air. Also with us is Paul Butler, a former U.S. prosecutor. Yusuf, I want to start with you. You served seven years behind bars for a crime you didn't commit, and you've spoken about the damage done by Trump's ad. Tell us what you think about this last-minute spree of federal executions as Trump is on his way out of office. You know, it's pure madness, and it echoes the same type of thing that I've been speaking about since I've been run over by the spike wheels of justice, that we live in two Americas. We are in the divided states of America as opposed to the United States of America. When you think about the, the idea of compassion, when you think about the idea that a person is in prison already doing time for a crime that they have said that they committed, um, that should be enough. But we want to be the judge, the jury, and the executioner. And the worst part about it is that if you look at the legacy of Donald Trump, a person who could have easily said, look, you know, these individuals, you know, let's just um, take the death sentence off and, and let them continue on with their, with their prison sentence. It would have been an honorable thing, a noble thing. But you look at Donald Trump and you think about the track record, not necessarily that he just had with me and the rest of my brothers, but the track record that he's had since he's been in the public eye. It's the most despicable kind of track record that anyone can have. And to still be in the space of that reality, 31 years ago, he's, he called for the death penalty for five individuals who it was found to be completely innocent of the crime that they were convicted of. And he never apologized and he still will never apologize. We're not waiting for an apology. But when I think about the other individuals that are, on, that are on death row, people that are languishing in prison, in New York, we were able to, in the, in the, uh, we, were, we were a part of the campaign in the death penalty and we were able to stop the death penalty in New York. But all, all around the country, this is the same type of things that we need to continue to stop. You know, and it's very, um, it's, 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 I'm thinking about the right word to use and sad comes to mind, but sad is not the word that I want to use when it comes to individuals like this young man that died last night, executed last night. You know, um, I don't think well, that there's a care crushing. when it comes to black and brown skin. It is soul crushing and there's no, there's no care when it comes to black and brown bodies. The most people... The people who've been pushed to the margins of society. And, you know, we've been just talking about equality. We've been talking about fairness. We've been talking about our humanity. And we've been denied all of that. And this is in a, in a, in a, in a place where we call home. We are American citizens. Mm -hmm. Yet we are not represented, but we are taxed equally, or well, some of us. <laughs> That's a good point there on the on the equal taxes. Um, Paul, Brandon's, Brandon Bernard's lawyer um, said that the nearly all white jury 
um, you know, convicted these two men. And, and the fact that the victims in the crime were white and the perpetrators were black are factors that historically lead to uh, pressure for the death penalty. Uh, lay out for us those racial disparities um, that exist in death penalty cases. I mean, personally, just so everybody knows, full disclosure, I am opposed to the death penalties because the criminal justice system already uh, has issues. And so I definitely do not want final uh, judgment for anyone in a system so uh, dysfunctional. But Paul, break down how this actually plays out in real life. The death penalty is the classic example of how black life doesn't matter as much mm -hmm. under the law as white life. You're more than 20 times more likely to get the death penalty if you're a black person who kills a white person as opposed to a white person who kills an African American. Justice Brennan on the Supreme Court has a famous dissent in which he says if you look at a death penalty case, don't ask how the crime went down, ask what was the race of the victim and what was the race of the defendant. That's the most important factor. And so we could say soul crushing. We could also say grotesque and unconstitutional. Last yes. night, Justice Sotomayor Soto, 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 Soto tried to get the Supreme Court to stop the execution because she was concerned that in Mr. Bernard's trial, the prosecution withheld evidence and put witnesses on the stand who lied. And all of the Central Park exonerated know about those kind of dirty tricks by prosecutors. Based on the evidence that came out after this trial, Zerlina, five of the jurors who voted to execute Mr. Bernard changed their mind. One of the prosecutors in the case changed her mind, but none wow. of that mattered. I have a follow up to that question, though, because it, it makes me wonder why is it so difficult to overturn wrongful convictions? I mean, anybody who likes true crime, right? Anybody who watches enough true crime understands that part of the once somebody is convicted, it's basically <clears throat> impossible to overturn uh, the lower court's decisions. And, and that seems both I, I think it's for a good reason, but also there's something to that. Can I can I maybe uh, start with answering that just from the perspective, right? So oh, sure. Yes, you can jump in. Sure. Yes. When we look at perspective, we realize a few things. One is that when it comes to the criminal justice system, I call it the criminal system of injustice. When it comes to the criminal justice system, you see that they say you are innocent until proven guilty. But when you see black and brown bodies being accused of crimes, the assumption is that these are the actual culprits and we're just gonna go through the process. Mm. And when you see people who have the complexion for acceptance, they get all of the best treatment under the law. The other part of it is this, there's this notion and I'm coming from what Donald Trump said. He said, they said, why do you continue to believe that the then called Central Park Five were guilty? He said, well, the police had so much evidence against them. Lay people, people watch, as you said, people who watch TV, who love TV shows, NCIS, CSI, you know, Chicago PD, all of these great TV shows, they are pseudo experts and they know one thing if they don't know anything, that the idea of things like forensics is an exact science. Forensic scientists can come into a mm -hmm. crime scene and almost recreate the whole crime scene. And when they get enough time, they can actually tell you the sequence of events. And so why is it that when you have a case like the Central Park Jagger case, as, a, as, a, as an example of the microcosm of the macrocosm of cases just like it, why is it that when you have this case where a woman lost three fourths of her blood, two individuals were arrested the night that this, that this incident happened, and we still were held out and presented in front of the people as the people who did this. It's because, and this is the other perspective, the system believes that the system is infallible. The Innocence Project mm. and the Innocence mm. Networks of America have proved by over 100, 200, 300 plus people that the system is fallible. People haven't just done one year in prison, one day in prison, three years in prison like a colleague Browder. They've done sometimes up to four decades. What kind of life is that? And then losing their lives sometimes after they come home because of the awful conditions 
in terms of healthcare in prison, nutrition in prison, we don't get the best. We get the absolute worst. It's a lock them up, throw away the key kind of situation. And this is something that the public doesn't really understand. When they go to be a part of the jury, sometimes they don't want to be there. I remember in the Central Park Jaga case, we looked at some footage on CNN. Raymond Santana was sitting down with one of the jurors, and he said, I, I was going crazy in the jury room. I found some cockamamie excuse right. to vote right. guilty just so that I could get out of there. Wow. Right. Mm. You said, I, I want to have you back. I want to do an entire uh, show about the criminal justice system. And, and I would love to include Paul in that as well, because both of you bring so much insight to this conversation. And it is one that we absolutely need to have um, in an in-depth fashion. Thank you so much, both of you, for being here. Paul Butler and Yusuf Salam, thank you very much. And please stay safe. Coming up. The number of Republicans blindly backing President Trump's attempt attempt to steal the election is growing. We're trying to figure out why so many members of Congress are following Trump down the rabbit hole and what the long-term consequences could be when we return in 90 seconds. I applaud the people of Texas for filing that lawsuit and, and all the other states that, that have gotten on board with it. And I fully support it. Um, and I think this is an avenue that needs to be checked. Our elections, things change. Those aren't conspiracy theories. Those are real things that happened and they haven't been. Revoked. 126. 64 percent. Nearly two thirds. That's how many Republicans in the House are supporting the baseless lawsuit filed by Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton, trying to invalidate and throw out millions of votes and overturn Joe Biden's completely legal election win. The president-elect said last week he believes he can work with Republicans despite these hurdles. But a former Republican staffer says Republicans will likely never accept Biden as president. Kurt, Kurt Bardella writes, in part, many people have said in recent weeks that it feels like Republicans and Democrats live on completely different planets. I wish it were that simple. In reality, what's happening is that one side sees a planet where the other sees nothing they don't even care to look because they don't even care to look. Democrats believe in facts, while Republicans have learned to believe in a world they make up for themselves. And joining me now is the author of that piece, Kurt Bardella, he is a senior advisor to the Lincoln Project. Kurt, let's begin with the lawsuit. What the heck is happening in this lawsuit? Break it down for us. What does it really mean? I mean, I mean, what it really means is it's absolute gibberish and nonsense, <laughs> as has been every single legal action taken so far 
by Donald Trump, Republicans, and his campaign. I mean, these guys are the poster child for why we need frivolous lawsuit reform in this country, because that's what this lawsuit amounts to. Nobody with any credibility, any legal expert says that this lawsuit has any merit, that it won't be outright dismissed. This is just a PR ploy, an effort to continue to delegitimize Joe Biden's election, and also to help Donald Trump continue to raise money. I mean, everyone seems to miss that with all the stuff going on right now, all the noise being thrown out there, Donald Trump is raising hundreds of millions of dollars off of this nonsense, and he has nothing to run for right now. What do you think he's gonna do with that money? People are just being led astray by Republicans and allowing Donald Trump to fill his coffers with cash. I wonder what he's gonna do with the money. Is it going towards his legal defense for after he's out of office? I mean, I think as we've seen just throughout his presidency, he will take money from anywhere that he can get it and he will use it for his own personal and family benefit. And something tells me he's definitely going to need a big war chest for all the legal troubles that are ahead of him. Kurt, we just got some breaking news in that the Supreme Court uh, rejected the Texas lawsuit. So uh, it's very related and relevant to this conversation. Um, it, you know, that said... You know, with that breaking news, this is not surprising news, by the way, um, because to your point, it's completely frivolous. But why are so many Republicans in Congress signing on to such a frivolous lawsuit that the Supreme Court has just rejected? I mean, it, it really tells us a lot about where we are in politics right now. The fact that we don't actually have a healthy two-party system. We have one party that believes in democracy, believes in the will of the people, believes in the American people's right to vote. And we have another party who believes that that should be taken away from you, that they should get to choose their voters, not the other way around. They believe that holding on to power is more important than any fidelity to any core conviction or morality or value. The Republican Party is no longer a party that's centered in any public policy agenda. There is no right-wing policy making. It's not about being pro-life or, or pro capital punishment or uh, you know, for lower taxes and lower government spending. They are only about holding on to power. And that's part of the point of why I wrote the piece for the LA Times that you talked about at the beginning of the segment, that Democrats need to wake up and realize mm -hmm. there is no working together here. You cannot work with people who have made it the core of their party to undermine democracy and American values. There's no way to do that. Has it always been this way? At what point did it go from, I mean, I have theories. I blame it on Newt Gingrich. But um, at what point did it shift from, you know, a, a conversation between two political opponents about policy, I, I think this thing, you think that thing, we come to a compromise, and it became like the other side is the enemy, and I'm holding on to power no matter what, and it, they, I can't allow any power to, you know, get in the hands of my enemy. When did it become that dynamic? And how do we get it back to the other way? You know, I... I really think that when you look at the origins of this, a lot of this to me, at least in my lifetime, you know, started in 2000 when the Republican Party filed lawsuit after lawsuit to try to stop votes from being counted in Florida to prevent Al Gore from rightfully claiming the presidency and a victory there. And then you look at what happened in the post 9-11 world where Republicans, their rhetoric became to be all about fear all about using the specter of terrorism and national security and homeland security and our troops to justify everything that they wanted to do. And along that time came the rise of Fox News. At the same time that 9-11 happened and we were living in this uncertain world and there was a lot of anxiety and fear, Fox News began to rise and became the most dominant voice in the Republican Party. And so those two things together, this radicalization of the party, as well as the, the influence of right-wing news and media all converged right after the events of 9-11. And I think that led directly to where we are right now. The only way I think to get it back, to answer your question, is an all-out repudiation and rejection at the polls of Republicans. I think that Republicans need to pay the electoral price. And unfortunately, in the last 2020 election here, it was kind of a split decision where, yeah, Joe Biden won unequivocally and of course, any standard and probably what is the most accurate election of all time now, looking at how many times we've counted votes. But the Republicans were able to hold on to the Senate. They made gains in the House. And so the message that Republicans got was, well, the Trump train isn't exactly the ticket to electoral disaster that everybody forecasted. So they're going to keep riding that until they are told by the voters that this is not the country that the American people want. 
That's sobering. I'm hopeful, though, that um, there may be some Republicans that are not in this group of 126 that may want to work with Joe Biden. But we'll see. Kurt Bardella, that was sobering. But reality, thank you for being here tonight and stay safe. Defund the police is a slogan that rang out across the nation during the George Floyd protests. Activists and progressives support it, but both Republicans and moderate Dem Democrats, including President-elect Biden, do not. Well, yesterday, the city council in Minneapolis, where Floyd was killed, turned the controversial slogan into action. The council passed a budget that cut about $8 million from the police department's roughly $180 million budget. The money will be used in part to fund mental health crisis teams, and better trained dispatchers to deal with mental health calls. And that's important. People with untreated mental illnesses are 16 times more likely to be killed by law enforcement. And according to Berkeley University study, while white men with mental illnesses are more likely to be given treatment, black men are more likely to be criminalized. So yes, Minneapolis may have defunded their police, but that money is being funneled into resources that could result in fewer police shootings. And while Republicans opposed to funding the police, they don't seem to have a problem with defunding other things. Just look at Donald Trump's budget proposal from earlier this year. They wanted to cut $84 billion from programs for people with disabilities. No one said he was defunding the disabled. He also proposed cutting $93 billion from education. Again, no one said he was defunding schools. And he wanted to cut $220 billion from the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, and no one screamed, he's defunding the hungry. But policing seems to be where Republicans draw the line. And joining me now is Minneapolis City Council member Jeremiah Ellison. Jeremiah, in your view, is this an example of defunding the police? You know, I think more so than focusing on defunding the police as some sort of obscure punishment, I think what we're really focused on is how we're expanding public safety. And we're expanding public safety in all the ways that you mentioned. Uh, we're creating a mental health response and incorporating it, incorporating that into our 911 system. Uh, we're investing in violence prevention, so these preemptive strategies that we think can save a lot of lives. And uh, the police take a lot of calls, a lot of time-wasting calls that, quite frankly, aren't emergencies and can be handled by other agencies. And so we're we're moving to take those off of their plate as well. I love that you you reframe that. It's expanding public safety. Uh, in a way that's necessary by re reallocating resources to where it's needed. The city council voted unanimously to redirect police funds to mental health initi initiatives, to your point. Is that something that you think would have happened without the death of George Floyd and the protests that followed? I feel like that energy obviously allowed us the space to have this conversation and for Minneapolis to change the funding allocations. You know, it absolutely added a degree of urgency that, quite frankly, just wasn't there before. You know, a small number of us on the city council have been fighting for these kinds of changes since I started my term three years ago. Uh, we started the Office of Violence Prevention, for example, um, just two years ago with a small amount of, uh, a, a amount of money. Uh, and we've been sort of partnering with, our, with the county, uh, in, in Hennepin County here in Minneapolis, uh, to deliver some semblance of a mental health response, but nothing that's been really robust healthily funded and, and citywide in 24 hours, uh, and nothing that's been integrated into our 911 system. It's always a special number you've got to call. And so um, I, I think that, that, that the murder of George Floyd absolutely um, uh, kicked uh, these efforts into high urgency, uh, despite the fact that they, they had been in some ways underway a few years prior. President-elect Biden said earlier this week uh, that defunding the police uh, as a movement was responsible for some of the losses Democrats experienced during the general election. That's been a popular narrative that's grown since Election Day. He also added that it could lead to a loss for George for loss for Democrats in the Georgia runoff races. Do you think that that's true or do you think that this, you know, the dynamic is a little overstated? We've seen this debate happen uh, in the month since the election and it, it, people are getting very passionate on both sides of it. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that there are some some Democrats, some folks in my, my party, unfortunately, uh, who uh, love to assign a narrative for why they lost their race and, and not really look at the real reasons for why they may have lost their race. I think that folks like AOC and my Congresswoman Ilhan Omar have, I think, very intelligently, uh, maybe more intelligently stated that folks who lost their races 
um, were folks who weren't taking strong stances on popular progressive policies. And folks who lost their races are folks who didn't have a great online presence, for example, during a pandemic, um, much less, you know, sort of as we progress into the 21st century and realize that digital, digital media is really important. Uh, and so, uh, you know, did you lose because uh, uh, activists around the country uh, decided that they needed a rallying cry to really change public safety? Or did you lose because you were a little lazy on social media or you didn't have a great digital strategy or because you refused to actually tell people what you stood for? Uh, I think that folks need to be a little bit more um, self-aware and, and examine actually why they lost. Self-awareness is an under <laughs> underappreciated quality um, in, well, not just in politics, but in life. Uh, members of the council uh, were also pushing to reduce the number of police in the city, and that was uh, subsequently after the killing of George Floyd. But as you recall, Minneapolis Mayor Jacob Frey threatened to veto the budget unless the provision was removed, and ultimately it was. Why was the concession made, and, and do you agree with it? I don't agree with the concession. And, and when it came up for a vote, uh, I actually voted against that amendment. Um, you know, I think what's what's funny, and this is slightly technical, and I don't mean to get into the weeds with folks who don't want to get into the weeds of municipal government, but um, the mayor and the council both proposed the same number of, uh, uh, of, of positions um, in the police force. What, what we did was we added uh, 140 positions that will go, that will stay vacant and will not be funded. Uh, but they gave, I think, some people uh, peace of mind that we weren't um, uh, actually uh, 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 making the investments that we were making. Uh, and so the number of police won't change, uh, not from the mayor's budget, not from our budget, uh, but we're going to hold these, vacants, uh, these vacancies open and unfunded um, because it makes some people feel better. <laughs> so. Well, thanks for breaking that down. I mean, sometimes these things don't make sense, but as long as they feel better. Jeremiah Ellison, thank you for being here. Coming up, investing in black communities. The NBA's Atlanta Hawks are doing just that by creating a unique partnership with black-owned banks. We're talking to the team COO next. But before we go to break, a reminder to check us out on Twitter. Follow us at Zerlina Show, and we're back in 60 seconds. The NBA, more than any other sports league, has been at the forefront of corporate social activism. After this summer's protests surrounding p police brutality, the league pledged $300 million over the next decade to support economic growth in black communities. But one team is going even further. This week, the Atlanta Hawks announced a deal exclusively with black-owned banks to refinance their $35 million construction loan for the team's training facility. The first of its kind deal will boost the lending capacity of these banks and allow them to better serve their communities. The banks will now be able to offer more financing for homes, small businesses, and even education. Earlier today, I got to speak with the Atlanta Hawks Chief Operating Officer, Thad Sheely, about the historic agreement. There are about 4,400 commercial banks in the United States, but only 18 of them are black owned and many of them don't have enough capital to compete with the major banks that we all know so well. Um, but you all still managed to strike this deal with the National Black Bank Foundation. Talk about the importance of that. 
Yes, thank you very much for having me on. Um, the National Black Bank Foundation is a brand new foundation uh, founded by Ashley Bell and uh, their general counsel. And, uh, and they really, their mission is really to make sure that the 18 black banks that we have left in this country that serve such a critical function to local community, that they survive for the next 50 years. Uh, in 1976, there were about 50 of these banks that were in existence, and now we're down to 18. Um, and part of the problem is that they don't necessarily have access to the same credit pool, right, and the same loans, and the same types of facilities that that that, that we that we are now in the process of putting this transaction together. Um, and so we think it's important to to support the National Black Bank Foundation. Yeah, it, it, there's so much history involved with this, and as you said, uh, they're down to such a, a low number, starting starting out at 50. The average white family, uh, and this is all related, the average white family has about eight times the wealth of the average black family, and that has a lot to do with the way black people have been historically left out of the American banking system writ large. Are you hopeful that a deal like this one could change that in the future? Look, we want to do our small part, um, you know, as a, to, to help support the black bank. Uh, we recognize that um, there's systemic issues and systemic racism that uh, that, that impact, uh, you know, black families and black lives. Um, uh, we want to do uh, our, our small part as a part of the community to uh, to make sure that these black banks survive. Um, but but I do think it's important that, to note that um, as much as you know, this is such an important. Uh, level of support for black banks. But from our perspective, it's also good business, right? These black banks were able to offer a competitive loan um, to us on competitive terms. Um, and so this, this very much is something that um, it's good business. You got to go look for it. And that's what the National Black Bank Foundation is mm -hmm. all about, making sure that the companies like our own can get connected to black banks, but that um, this is good business. That's such a good point, because I think oftentimes if somebody came across this headline, they would think that um, you were you were only doing it for the sort of symbolic and historic importance, as opposed to also it being good, a good business decision. Um, and you're not the first NBA team to do this. You're the first major sports team, period, to strike a deal exclusively with black banks. Are you hopeful that other teams and other sports leagues um, will follow suit? This seems like a, a pretty cool precedent to, to start, and I hope it becomes a trend. Uh, yeah, it's one of those things that in retrospect, uh, why hasn't it happened? Um, and, uh, and where we can lead the way and we can put our principles into action, um, whether we're the first or, or whether we're one of many, I, I think it matters less that, um, that it happens and it happens more frequently uh, across the NBA and across sports and across all business. Okay, I'm going to get a little technical for a second. The amount of money invested into a bank controls how much money that bank is then able to lend to other people. With that in mind, uh, tell me what this $35 million deal with black banks will mean for those communities in particular. Right. So um, you're talking about the tier one capital for banks. And so in order for banks to loan out money, they have to have enough assets under management, and then they have to generate fees through which they can also lend against. Um, and so this generates fee income. We pay interest, we pay, uh, we pay standard fees, we got a very good interest rate, uh, which we're proud of from a business perspective. Um, and then those dollars can go, and they have a multiplier effect, a multiplier effect in the bank itself. And then when those banks go to loans for small businesses uh, and entrepreneurs in black communities, Right, but that has its own compounding effect, um, and so um, so every dollar invested with a black bank that they can generate fees on, that they can loan out, helps to support black businesses across the country. It's so important. The Hawks have been very consistent uh, in social in the social activism space. In October, the team invested forty million dollars in Atlanta. Five million of which went to the largest nonprofit center for black entrepreneurs in the nation, so critically important. You even turned your arena into a huge voting location, which turned out to be pretty important in the state of Georgia in that election. Can you speak uh, on the importance of going beyond making just a statement uh, or putting a slogan on the back of a jersey and actually putting your money where your mouth is? Um, well, thank you for that. I mean, it's been. So proud to be part of, of this organization and 
uh, really sort of, you know, putting our money where our mouth is and, and taking actions. And that, and that starts at the top. And that starts with, with Tony Ressler and his $50 million commitment, uh, $40 million commitment, I apologize, to, uh, to, to, to black economic empowerment in, specifically in Atlanta, um, that those are the types of things that we think uh, make an impact. Um, when Tony first uh, became governor of the team, he was very clear that um, this is a community asset. Um, and it's a community asset, not just because uh, it says Atlanta, all right, on the on our jersey, um, but because of the kind of impact that the Atlanta Hawks can make. And we take that seriously, and um, it's very exciting. And 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 Coach Pierce, who I who I see up there, has been a real leading light for change uh, amongst the the NBA Coaches Association and the NBA Foundation. Um, you know, we're we're not the only ones that um, that's doing great things, obviously. The NBA Foundation has committed $300 million over the next 10 years um, for these types of issues, and, uh, and we're proud to be a part of it. Yeah, the NBA is, I think, uh, one of the sports leagues that I admire for all they do with NBA Cares, and, um, you know, they do so much uh, in the community. The NBA is also returning tonight amid uh, what we've been all experiencing in terms of the surge in the pandemic around the country. There's no bubble for this season, but what type of precautions are in place to protect the players from coming down with COVID? Well, there's not one bubble in place. There's 30 bubbles. Um, in place. And so um, mm -hmm. nine months ago today, the Hawks played their last game at State Farm Arena. Um, that's the longest break that I think these young players have had in their entire lives. Um, and so you can be sure that, that they are very excited to, to get back to be playing. But, but we are creating our own bubble um, in our arena. Um, the NBA, like you said, I think um, has, uh, has really risen to the occasion. Um, the amount of support um, that we're getting uh, around testing protocols and safety for our players, our coaches, um, that, you know, there might only be 30 players on the court, 15 from each side, but there's probably 100, uh, 100 plus people that are going to be in the building tonight to make sure that we can have a, a live game. And so we want to make sure that, um, that everyone is safe and that step by step, we're going to make sure that we welcome our fans back as safely as possible to State Farm Arena. Absolutely. So good luck tonight and in the season. Thad Chili, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having us. My thanks to Thad Sheely for that conversation. Before we go, I want to turn back to the breaking news we've been following. The Supreme Court has just rejected a lawsuit by Texas that has had asked the court to throw out the presidential election results in four battleground states won by President-elect Joe Biden. The New York Times writes tonight, quote, there will, there will continue to be scattered litigation, brush fires around the nation from Mr. Trump's allies. But as a practical matter, the Supreme Court's action puts an end to any prospect that Mr. Trump will win in court what he lost at the polls. The shorter version, it's all over but the shouting. That does it for me tonight. I'm Zerlina Maxwell. The Many Hassan Show is coming up after a short break right here on Peacock. And he will have much more on that breaking news out of the Supreme Court. Have a good weekend and stay safe.
Good evening, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Breaking news tonight, the lawsuit we have been discussing for days, the Texas Attorney General's attempt to overturn Joe Biden's win in the 2020 presidential election has been rejected by the US Supreme Court, ending the president's last desperate attempt to stay in office. So where does Donald Trump go from here? Perhaps Mar-a-Lago on January 20th. But here's an important number we cannot forget tonight, 126 Republican lawmakers, a majority of their caucus in the US House, joined with 18 states to sign on to the Texas Attorney General's absurd Hail Mary rejected lawsuit that asked the Supreme Court to overturn the results of the election in four key battleground states, to throw out 20 million votes and hand Donald Trump four more years of rule that he didn't earn. Multiple Democratic state attorneys general had openly called the lawsuit a coup attempt, including Maryland's Democratic Attorney General Brian Frosch, right here last night on the show. Frankly, I, I mean, I think it's a coup attempt. Donald Trump lost this election. It's unquestionable. They're looking for any thread that they can grasp uh, to try to unravel that victory and to, to place Donald Trump back in power. It's, uh, it's the yeah. grossest attempt at a coup uh, in American history, I think. Here's another number you should know, 19. That's how many of these rebellious House Republicans hail from Georgia, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. So to be clear, they join their names to the Texas AG's bad faith lawsuit petitioning the courts to invalidate the votes in the very four states whose voters also elected them to serve last month. 19 members of Congress who would have had you believe that, quote, the 2020 election suffered from significant and unconstitutional irregularities in the defendant states. Their states, but their elections apparently were just fine. They are truly the worst hypocrites of that bunch. And here they are. Here are all their names. Don't forget them. These 19 should be particularly ashamed to show up in Congress at the swearing in next month. But they're not, because it's not about principle for them. It's about power. This was an open assault on a free and fair election, the likes of which I haven't seen in my lifetime. Not here, not in the UK, not in Germany, France, Canada, Australia, any time in modern democratic history. They wanted to get rid of 20 million votes. And we keep falling back on this idea that the Republicans backing Donald Trump's latest, perhaps last ditch coup attempt, are cowards running scared of their base. But that's only part of what's going on. See, they have their own agenda, and it's not Trump's. We know why the president was doing this, a very real fear of losing his fortune and his freedom after leaving office. The New York Times reporting today that Manhattan District Attorney Cyrus Vance is stepping up his investigations into Trump's finances. That's on top of the New York State Attorney General's own probe. And none of these go away if Trump tries to issue himself a pardon at the federal level. But the GOP's own self-serving agenda is beginning to emerge from all of this. First, Republicans want to increase voter suppression in the US. Even Republicans who had rejected Trump's insane coup attempt have indicated they want greater certainty in future elections and are using all this chaos as an excuse to press for new restrictions on voting. In Georgia, Governor Brian Kemp and Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger have both refuted Trump's fraud claims, but they've also called for greater voter ID requirements to be extended to mail-in ballots. How convenient. Second, congressional Republicans desperately want to delegitimize the Biden presidency before it even begins, to cast a shadow over him and his appointees. Senator Ted Cruz saying that quiet part out loud, telling Axios, quote, as long as there's litigation ongoing and the election result is disputed, I do not think you will see the Senate act to confirm any nominee. Well, he's got one less lawsuit to worry about tonight. Remember, the election result isn't disputed, but they want to pretend it is so they can block, block, block. Four more years of chaos of the party of no, of the ghost of birtherism and illegitimacy, now haunting a new Democratic president. This is the Republican strategy for surviving a Democratic presidency. But the question now is, can democracy survive this Republican party?
Joining me now is Minnesota's Democratic Attorney General and former Congressman Keith Ellison. Thank you so much for coming back on the show. Attorney General, Thank first, you, what is your response to the Supreme Court, the highest, la the highest court in the land, rejecting this suit aimed at overturning the will of the people, a suit that was backed by 18 states other than Texas and over half of the Republicans in the House of Representatives. Also a Supreme Court where you have a, a 6-3 majority for conservatives, also a court where Trump has appointed uh, the last justices that are on that court rejected it flatly. Why? Because it's meritless. In fact, um, if any attorney working at the Minnesota Attorney General's office filed a lawsuit with as little legal and factual support as this, I would expect that they'd get hit with what we lawyers call Rule 11 sanctions, which is something that you get for filing frivolous litigation and choking up the court with nonsense. That's exactly what they have done. And I, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, is there a price to be paid for it? Because I know your average young lawyer practicing in the, across the United States would be fearful about practicing garbage. I mean, about submitting and filing garbage that they just filed. And these yes. people are supposed to be attorneys general. Indeed, so, you know, uh, I, I, garbage is the right word for it. Uh, let me let me ask you this. Let me ask you this, Attorney General. Senator Ben Sass, a Republican, uh, well-known, mild critic of the president, uh, just put out this statement. Since election night, he says, a lot of people have been confusing voters by spinning Kenyan Bertha type Chavez rigged the election from the grave conspiracy theories. But every American who cares about the rule of law should take comfort that the Supreme Court, including all three of President Trump's picks, closed the book on the nonsense. My question to you, Really, is the book closed? I wouldn't put anything past this party. Is it closed? I suspect not. I mean, how many times when I was in Congress did we have to vote to, to not repeal the Affordable Care Act? How many times did President Obama have to put up with uh, them obstructing him for no legitimate reason whatsoever? I mean, you know, they actually attacked President Obama because he wore a tan suit at one time. The nonsense is not <laughs> going to stop. Trump didn't start the nonsense. And this lawsuit's not going to, this decision by the Supreme Court is not going to stop the nonsense. This is about delegitimation, yes, of the Biden administration, but I believe it's about delegitimation of the democratic process itself. I think that what's at the bottom of all this, what's at the bottom of this and birtherism and the many other things is the idea that unworthy people are now part of the body politic and they just can't stand it. Yeah. Indeed, and more than 120, I have to keep saying this, more than 120 Republican members of the House openly called this week to overturn a free and fair election. Uh, your former Democratic colleague in the House, Congressman Bill Pascrell, is saying they shouldn't be seated in the House because, quote, men and women who would act to tear the United States government apart cannot serve as members of the Congress. One newspaper today in Florida reversed its endorsement of one of those GOP legislators, Michael Waltz, what should happen to these 126 GOP House members now, in your view? Surely they can't just get away with this. Well, I mean, the fact is they need to be challenged. And Bill Pascrell is absolutely right. They need to bring ethical charges, whatever it can be brought against these people, to hold them to account, to let them know that you don't undermine the democratic process that, that elected you, and then turn right around and say that it's not legitimate for the, for the president who was just duly elected. Uh, the, the, th the fact is, I will personally say that as a Democrat lifelong, that we put up with too much of this stuff. We act like we're, we are, we're, we're gonna be the adults in the room, we're gonna be calm and try to appeal to their better nature, but it's looking less and less like they have a better nature to appeal to. I mean, this stunt, yes. it's not the worst thing we've seen in American history. We did have the Civil War where people, uh, members of Congress included, took up arms against the United States of America in order to maintain slavery. That did happen. It's not the worst thing, but it's up in the top five. It's definitely one of the worst of our lifetimes, I think, yours and mine, in terms Absolutely. of democracy and the challenge agree. to democracy. I I want to play you a bit of discussion from an incoming member of Congress. You said, you know, it's hard to work with these Republicans. Here's one of them, Georgia's very extremist, far-right, QAnon believer, Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, who thinks people like you are part of an Islamic invasion of American politics. Have a listen to what she's had to say about this election result.
coming under tables, things that have been debunked by Georgia officials. Is there not a danger to bringing up those conspiracy theories that have been debunked already? Well, those aren't conspiracy theories. Those are real things that happened and they haven't been debunked. Uh, Georgia voters, the Secretary Republican, of State went through. We, we, line, I've called for his resignation. We, we don't want Brad Raffensperger as our Secretary of State. He's done a terrible job. Uh, he basically did Stacey Abrams job for her. So, uh, I mean, there's no reasoning with people like that, right? I, no you know, one expects anyone to try and reason with people like Marjorie Taylor Greene. But, but what do you do about the other Republicans in the House who are maybe not as conspiratorial or as crazy as she is, but have signed on to the same lawsuit that she signed on to? What about your fellow Minnesotans uh, in Congress from the Republican Party? People you um, serve with, I'm guessing, in the House. People like Tom Emmer, Tom Hammer, Jim Hagedorn, Pete Stauber. What are they thinking? Do you, do you speak to these people off the record? What is going on in that party? Well, I know Tom Emmer. And um, Tom Emmer, cameras off, is a nice person and a reasonable guy. <laughs> but when the cameras go on, all bets are off. And he will say or do anything in order to advance power. And uh, I'm sad to say that. I, I believe that you should not let the words that you say be different from the actions that you take. And uh, some of those guys, uh, quite frankly, uh, they would probably joke about how ridiculous it all was, which is even worse because yes. it just shows how cynical they are and how uh, much of a crowd, uh, a, pan a pandering crowd pleaser that they are. And that's, that's really sad. Yeah. Well, on that note, at the same time that most House Republicans were signing on to this attempt to overturn the election, this failed attempt, uh, the Washington Post today reported on an increasing number of Republicans uh, supposedly telling reporters they're concerned, quote unquote, about Trump, but unwilling to let those reporters print their names. I mean, what are they so scared of? Trump is on his way out. Are they still scared of being primaried? What is the fear? Well, there's Trump and there's Trumpism. There's the philosophy that brought him into power, and there's the philosophy that we are gonna to have to be dealing with for, I think, a while um, involving Trump. He has said to a large section of Americans, a minority, but still a large section, that they have been treated with grievous unfairness by minorities, by immigrants, by Muslims, and by a lot of other folks, and they've been hard done by, by all these others, uh, and that they are victims, and and he they feed that narrative, and sadly, the Democratic Party has yeah. not yet made an effective enough argument to working class people that that is not true, that actually we do want to make yes. sure you can live in prosperity and equality, and where you live is not forgotten. It is part of our nation. We will invest in it, and so that's what's going on. There are real problems across our country that I think are legitimate and real, and they have to do with disinvestment, deindustrialization, bad trade policy. The Republicans' answer is it's the Mexicans and the Muslims, and the and, the, and our party so far has yes. been, yeah, we're for you, when we'll get to it as soon as we can. And, and I'm sorry, that's just not going to work. We've got no, to have not, a robust. It's not. It's not um, going to work, and it's, and it's it's not. It's not going to work and it's not good enough. That's the problem. Uh, let me just talk Trump. about the law. You are an attorney general dealing at the state level. Much of what is happening is because Trump recognizes that he faces real legal liabilities at the state and local levels after leaving office, even if he pardons himself for any federal offenses. What are you That's hearing right. out of New York on the attorney general's investigation there or the Manhattan DA's interviews with Trump's bankers? You know, I think it's very important that you raise this issue because I think a lot of us who've been watching Trump will, might conclude that this is another narcissistic fit that he's throwing. But the truth is, he has real exposure. I mean, he has real exposure. I mean, you know, let me just tell you, the attorney general in New York just recently went after the NRA, not for politics, but for corruption, <laughs> you know? I mean, Tish James, my colleague, is a serious woman who believes in the rule yeah. of law. And she's not going to let anybody operate above the law, nor will she tolerate anybody being beneath the law. And Donald Trump is going to have his comeuppance and is going to have to be accountable for his behavior. And that is what he is absolutely terrified of. 
Uh, I think you're right about that. It's definitely uh, motivating a lot of what we're seeing. Uh, just one last thing before I let you go. Uh, in terms of what's going on in Minnesota and the COVID crisis, uh, this afternoon, uh, your office announced that you will be suing a Minnesota bar that is refusing to close in violation of the governor's COVID orders there. Now, we all know that indoor gatherings uh, are places, uh, especially in restaurants and bars, one of the biggest spreaders of this deadly virus. We know that. But surely you're sympathetic to what the owner of that bar has told reporters, which is that they can't survive financially if they're forced to stay closed. Congress has failed small business owners in this country. So what are they supposed to do? You know, it's deeply frustrating. And I, and I say that uh, I feel for the, every one of these business owners, they have a very, very difficult situation. Um, what I'm saying is that Congress must act quickly to help get them through this crisis, but I must protect people from the spread of COVID. I simply cannot allow uh, our hospitals to be so choked with patients that we can't even begin to handle the crisis that people are, 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 are coming into. You know, right now, you know, I think yesterday or the day before, we had 3,100 people dead in the United States. That's more people who died on a single day because of COVID than 9-11, Mandy. So I can't just sit around and say, you know, take, you know, live at your own risk. You know, it's not my problem. It is my problem. I swore to uphold the law and I am going to do so. But I do so with a tremendous amount of sympathy. And I wish Congress would really just get busy for these folks who need the help desperately and including uh, local government, including unemployment, and certainly for small business support. Indeed, it's a travesty that the aid package has not yet been agreed. Uh, Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison, thank you so much for your time. Thanksgiving is now two weeks behind us. Health experts warned we wouldn't see an immediate uptick in COVID cases that it would take a little time. And yet already the CDC has said hospital rates are at their highest point since the beginning of the pandemic, setting record after record, day after day. Uh, it appears now that the COVID cases caused from those maskless family gatherings over the holiday period are already starting to show up in hospital waiting rooms and ICUs. And the Christmas travel season is also right around the corner. And that's one of the problems with the coronavirus, of course, the lag. It takes time for the cases to develop, for the data to come in. Consider this. Researchers are just now linking 330,000 coronavirus cases to a Boston conference attended by 175 people back in February. Infection spread to 29 states and three other countries. 330,000 cases. It's now December, and we're just now realizing the toll, the damage of one conference nearly one year ago. You recall in the early days of the pandemic, experts urged uh, Americans to wipe everything down, clean your groceries, don't touch elevator buttons, wear gloves, and stay six feet away. Everything changed. Our work, school, shopping, dining. No place was safe. Nothing was enough. We were under attack. We know now that although we should still wash our hands, surface transmission, for example, is actually, thankfully, extremely rare. We've also learned that airborne transmission, though, is one of our biggest threats, and a distance of six feet as a result may not even be enough. Researchers in South Korea found that the virus was spread from one person to another in just five minutes with 20 feet between them indoors. And so the numbers keep going up. As of today in the US, more than 15 million cases have been confirmed. We've now counted more than 200,000 COVID cases a day for most of December as infections surge across the country. 200,000 per day. Yes, a vaccine is on the way, but we're nowhere near out of the woods. In fact, things are only going to get worse before they get better. Joining me now to discuss this is epidemiologist and health economist, Dr. Eric Feigelding. Uh, Eric, thanks for coming back on the show. Uh, the CDC director said yesterday that he's estimating we could be at 450,000 dead by February. Is that what you're predicting too? Yeah, that is actually quite an underestimate. He said for the next 60 to 90 days, we will have at least a 9-11 scale mortality from COVID every single day for the next 60 and 90 days. So if you just multiply 90 by uh, 3,000, that is 270,000. And I think it could be even higher because we're at 
we're already past 3,000 deaths now. We could e easily pass half a million, you know, approaching maybe three quarters of a million in the worst case scenario. We are literally living in the worst case scenario th that we could have imagined uh, several months ago. And right now, still we have and, the mass yeah. wars. Still we have uh, denialism about the, the cases, still conspiracies about doctors fudging numbers. These are real. You can't fudge hospitalization numbers. You can't fudge body bags and morgues overflowing. These, this is real. Yeah, it is real. It is tragic. It was totally preventable. Um, and now we have to kind of replay what was going on in the spring. Governor Andrew Cuomo in New York is stopping indoor dining uh, from Monday. And I understand why. Uh, I was just speaking to the Attorney General of Minnesota, Keith Ellison, about what's going on there. I understand why restaurant owners, small business owners are upset too. Congress has failed them. They're not getting the compensation money they need. But you know what I really don't understand? Why is it so many people are still eating and drinking indoors in restaurants and bars unmasked when we've known for a while that bars and restaurants are one of the biggest spreaders of this virus? I just, I just don't get it. Yeah, I don't quite get it either because we've had airborne warnings for quite a while. In fact, all the Asian countries, all the specific uh, countries already assumed that this virus is airborne. Now, earlier this summer, late this, uh, uh, we recognized that it was airborne, but the message did not get out. The, the federal government, of course, they didn't take much action, but the state governments, they did not take action as much either. And many of them closed down way too late. And we, there's studies that actually show states that took containment measures kept it down longer. And states like uh, South Dakota, yeah. uh, the epidemic soared even uh, longer. But the problem at the end of the day is we don't have enough support for people to actually, you know, improve the air quality in addition to the messaging. We don't have funding for air quality cleaning in schools. If we should close down bars and restaurants and bail out the restaurant workers and the uh, the waiters and waitresses. Yeah. But we Agreed. also need to make sure that our schools are safe yeah. for our kids to return. And Germany gives 100 million euros for schools' so, air quality. We have nothing. So, Eric, aside from the vaccine, we hear a lot of chatter about the vaccine, the FDA decision yesterday. Uh, what public health measures could a President Joe Biden on January 20th take to try and turn around this crisis? He's talked about asking people to wear masks once he's sworn in for the first 100 days. But he really has no power to enforce that at a state or local level in a place like South Dakota, for example. So what else can he do to stem the bleeding, as it were, from the get go? Yeah, I think masks are, of course, really key. And I think he should also, in addition to a federal mask mandate for public uh, transportation areas that he does have control over, he could invoke the Defense Production Act for masks, especially premium masks, these melt-blown masks that are much higher quality than cloth masks. Because cloth masks works when 95% of the people wear them, but if a large segment of our population don't, which we know don't, we need premium masks, and we should have invoked this way long ago rather than invoking DPA for burgers and sausages in those factories. And in addition, yeah, air 100%. quality, as it, it is so key. We need to fund air quality, air cleaning products for our school so that we can actually get our kids back in school. And that is actually the number one uh, agreed priority for both sides of the aisle, people across the spectrum. And, you know, Biden can do that. And of course, he, there's, he also has the federal highway funds that he can use as a carrot and stick to ensure state compliance on certain uh, mask mandates. Thank you for that. That is all stuff that should be done, has to be done. I don't understand uh, if it's not done, why it won't be done. The mask production is key. I think it was Bernie Sanders a few months ago who put forward a proposal to have free masks paid for, produced for by the government and sent to every house in, in America. Um, I hope the Biden administration uh, considers doing that. You were heavily criticized, Eric, at the start of the pandemic, including by some of your fellow epidemiologists for being alarmist. Uh, and yet I feel like maybe more people should have been alarmist, given no one was predicting half a million dead within a year back in January or February, were they? Yeah, it was just really hard to imagine that this calamity could hit us. It's, it's almost akin to shouting that an asteroid is coming or aliens arrive. It is just 
that difficult to imagine, but the science supports it. This airborne spread, people denied it for the longest time. Asymptomatic transmission, people denied it for the longest time. All these things that we assumed that we did not know for sure, but if you had assumed that they were real and many of the Asian countries assumed it and took action quickly, then we got it under control. And now look, New Zealand and Australia have soccer matches of 10,000, 20,000 people yeah. in their stadium and pool parties. We do not have that because we did not listen yeah. to science and we did not take the precautions. And, you know, public health is one of those things that is always underfunded and underrecognized. But you have to take these precautions yeah. and take action fast, swiftly with good leadership. A friend of mine was uh, in Australia the other day attending a cricket match with 20,000 people. It's like living on a different planet to the rest of us, what's going on over there. It can be done. Um, let me ask yes. you this one last quick question, Eric. Yesterday, the FDA advisory committee voted to approve emergency authorization of the Pfizer vaccine. And yet some people, credible people, not just mad anti-vaxxers, are saying they don't want to take it yet. Uh, if you were offered it tomorrow morning, would you take it without any hesitation, without any reservations? Absolutely. The vaccine is our ultimate exit because we know we have such poor leadership on the state levels. And But what at the end of the day, vaccines, remember, have saved hundreds of millions of lives. This past century alone, we know that the vaccines now are so much safer than they've ever been, and they are so effective. If only people take it, because it's not the vaccines that ultimately save lives. It's the vaccine rollout programs. And when people take yes. the vaccines, when we can have our lives back to normal. And having our lives back to normal and our economy back to normal is so critical for everyone, regardless of your political affiliation yes. or your belief. Eric Feigelding, thank you so much for your time and your insights. We appreciate it. Still ahead, Trump said he was ready to lead America into battle. I look at it, I, I view it as a, uh, in a sense, a wartime president. I mean, that's what we're fighting. I mean, it's, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a very tough situation here. So why nine months later is the U.S. facing a 9-11 sized death toll every day under the president's command? It's infuriating. And later, the Manhattan District Attorney intensifies his investigation of Trump. One of the Donald's former top executives will help us figure out what he might be looking for back in 60 seconds. I can't imagine how they feel about losing their family. And I wish that we can all go back and change it. And I'm sorry for all the pain that I've caused. Those were the words of Brandon Bernard, a 40-year-old man who spent the last 20 years in prison after being convicted for his role in the killing of two youth ministers when he was only 18. Despite desperate pleas from lawyers, activists, celebrities, and even some jurors who convicted him back in 2000 to stop the execution. Their argument being that he was only a teenager at the time of the crime and didn't carry out the killing of the couple himself. 
And yet, Brandon Bernard was put to death last night. The Trump administration is also trying to carry out another execution as soon as possible, maybe even tonight, this time a 56-year-old Alfred Bourgeois. Uh, Alfred was sentenced to death in 2004 for the killing of his two-year-old daughter. After his trial, doctors and lawyers determined that he had severe deficits in mental functioning, scoring near intellectual disability on his IQ tests. They criticized his defense attorneys for not properly investigating Alfred's mental state. But the push to execute him remains. Brandon and Alfred are two of 10 federal executions that were scheduled for this year after Trump and Attorney General Bill Barr lifted the 17-year informal moratorium put in place by George W. Bush. And it's been 130 years since a US president carried out executions during a transition period. Plus, Trump isn't even done. His critics say he's on a killing spree. Three more people are scheduled to be executed the week before President-elect Biden takes office. These recent events have prompted renewed calls by politicians and activists alike to abolish the death penalty. But they also have revealed how tough it is to publicly argue for that position. After New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio, for example, tweeted that the death penalty should be abolished, Senator Ted Cruz told him he was siding with the murderer which clearly misses the whole point. Civil rights leaders argue that the flaws in the criminal justice system leave too much room for error and not enough for redemption. Biden, who once supported the death penalty himself, has pledged to stop them at the federal level and incentivize the 28 states who still allow it to follow his lead. Lest we forget, the US remains the only G7 country to still carry out capital punishment. So, are we any closer to full-on ab abolition of the death penalty in this country? Joining me now to discuss this is Cassandra Stubbs, director of the ACLU's Capital Punishment Project. She's been part of that team since 2006 and has defended death row inmates across the country. Cassandra, thanks for joining me. Uh, two men were executed via lethal injection in this country in the last month alone. At least three more scheduled before President-elect Biden is sworn into office. We could have an execution tonight. Uh, you work on this issue. Do you have any idea why Trump is doing this, executing as many people as he can on his way out of the door, especially in the midst of a pandemic? Well, I can't speculate about why President Trump and, and Attorney General Bill Barr would go forward with such a plan, but I can talk about why I think it really makes no sense. I think when we look at how America has viewed capital punishment, there's no question that the country is turned away from the death penalty, largely uh, in both legislatures and, and in public opinion. And at the same time, even the states that have been major users of the death penalty have taken a pause because of the incredible public health cost of holding an execution during a pandemic. President Trump has not only carried out nine and, and possibly this evening, 10 executions, far more than any other federal administration ever has, but he's trying to do so at a time when it puts not only the health and safety of his own staff, the health and safety of the prisoners, the health and safety of the witnesses, everyone involved with the process, but also the communities in, in around the country. I mean, people are flying around. We're holding essentially what are small mini death conventions inside of a federal yeah. prison. It's, it's, a, it's an astonishingly Indeed. bad plan. I completely agree with you. It's horrible on so many levels. Uh, the Daily Beast reported today that according to two people with knowledge of the situation, Trump seemed particularly horrified by descriptions of the killings of the two youth ministers in the Brandon Bernard case. And the, by that point, there was no changing Trump's mind. Isn't that so bizarre and concerning that one man, someone like Trump, no less, has the power to choose who lives and dies in our system? It is, and I think when we look at Brandon Bernard's case, there's so many pieces that are, uh, that show us what is wrong with the death penalty. When we look at his youth, the fact that this was a crime he committed when he was 18 years old, you know, if, if he had been one year younger, if he had been 17, he wouldn't have been eligible for the death penalty. And today we know that your brain hasn't even finished forming at age 18. He, he was He was a young man at the time that he committed the crime. But more than that, I think... What many Americans do not realize in this country is that you can get the death penalty even if you are not the person who killed the victims. And Brandon Bernard was not the killer and that the person responsible for their for their murders. And yet, under our 
unfair and overly broad death penalty. He was able to receive the death penalty and then, of course, ultimately, tragically executed last night for, for this role that, that, that was not yeah. the leading role. I think, you know, these so are the reasons... when you look at a case like his... Oh, yeah, sorry, well, I was going to say, when you look at a case like his, uh, as you say, it reflects so much about the death penalty. Uh, for example, it's so arbitrary. You have the man known uh, what was as the Golden State Killer, uh, who was found guilty of killing 13 and raping nearly 50 women in the mid-70s. He was given life imprisonment, and just, you know, just this August. And then you have Brandon Bernard, who didn't kill anyone, as you say, himself, and he's sentenced to death. You also have the racism. Black people, despite being 13% of the population, I believe, rep represent 34% of executions. Yeah, I was going to say, it's, it's both right to think about arbitrariness, but also when we look at Brandon Bernard, it's not totally arbitrary. When we look at the case, because so much is predicted by race, so much is predicted by the quality of your lawyer, by whether you're rich or poor. I mean, the death penalty in America is applied to poor people, and it is overwhelmingly applied to people of color, and it is far the most applied to people who are charged and convicted of killing white victims. It's white victim discrimination where, where we see prosecutors are much more likely to seek the death penalty, juries are much more likely to impose the death penalty, and mm. executives like President Trump are much more likely to carry out the death penalty if the victim in the case was white. You know, there's just no place in, in a society to allow these kinds of decisions that go really to the to the humanity of all of us to turn on, on, on racial bias in the way that we know it does in the death penalty. Yes, indeed it does. The family of the couple who was killed uh, spoke about how Bernard was remorseful and apologized to them. Uh, take a listen. The apology and the remorse that was shown to the family and the fact that they regretted their acts at that time helped very much to heal my heart. And I can truly say I forgive them. Powerful words there, talking of forgiveness. Uh, but they also thanked Trump for carrying out what they said was justice. And that seems to be the hardest part about arguing against the death penalty, that the victims want what they see as justice. How do you grapple with that? How do you overcome that? Well, first, I think we have to look at, at the spectrum of, of what individuals want who are who are the victims and and then when we look at the these cases in particular president trump and attorney general bill barr went against the wishes of a large number of victims from many of these cases you know who who both begged the the president not to carry out the executions in some cases and in other cases not to do it at a time when it jeopardized so much health and lives and safety because of of the pandemic but even aside from that you know to, to the extent that the death penalty is about the morality of a nation, to the extent that the death penalty is about what goals we as a society have, those we of course all of our hearts go out to to the victims of every terrible crime, but that does not mean that we should then carry out an unjust, unfair, and discriminatory yeah. punishment in their names. Quick last question. We have 30 seconds left. One of Biden's campaign pledges was that he'll end the death penalty at the federal level. He'll encourage states to follow his lead. Uh, he used to be a death penalty supporter himself. Do you have faith that the Biden administration, does the ACLU believe that he can go beyond just a moratorium, maybe abolish it once and for all? Absolutely. I think President Biden, like the majority of this country, has, has evolved on this issue. We have seen more Americans today prefer alternatives to the death penalty. As we have seen, it doesn't protect the innocent, it's racially biased, and it's, it's fundamentally unfair. I expect President Biden will, will be able to work with us to, to fully end the death penalty. I hope you're right. I guess time will tell. Cassandra Stubbs, thank you so much for your time. Still ahead, the death toll in the United States from COVID now exceeds that of 9-11 every single day. I bet you remember where you were, what you did on 9-11. Then why is losing so many people every day simply unremarkable for many Americans? Back in 60 seconds.
question creeps into your mind, how much longer is this going to go on? Um, the the national statistics say that this this uh, and certainly the local statistics say that this this surge is not going to peak for another month or so. Um, so we're steadying ourselves and we're preparing ourselves to do the best we can. Do you remember where you were on 9-11? We all do, right? I was in the first week of a new job in England, just back from a lunch break when the second plane hit the Twin Towers. None of us can forget what happened that day or what happened in the aftermath of those attacks. America, I think we can all agree, radically changed that day on so many levels. So much happened as a result of 3,000 innocent people being killed in a single day back in September 2001. The 9-11 attacks, they said, could not go unanswered. I can hear you, the rest of the world hears you, and the people, and the people who knock these buildings down will hear all of us soon. In fact, I need you all to remember what we did in response to 9-11. I just need 60 seconds. Start the clock. We did the war on terror, the AUMF, the authorization of the use of military force. Are you with us or against us? The invasion of Afghanistan, the occupation of Afghanistan, the axis of evil, torture, the prison camp at Guantanamo Bay, the invasion of Iraq, the occupation of Iraq, Abu Ghraib, black sites, waterboarding, rectal feeding, sleep deprivation, torture, the Patriot Act, the FISA Amendments Act, prisons, stellar wind, all of the other NSA surveillance programs, national security letters, enemy combatants, detention without trial, military commission, cyber warfare, torture, the creation of the Department of Homeland and security, the creation of ICE, the creation of the TSA, the militarization of the police, the rounding up of Muslims, NCS, increased deportations, increased border security, black ops, extraordinary rendition, drone strikes, including the assassination of a US citizen abroad without trial, torture, PTSD, censorship, self-censorship, spying on mosques, spying on Congress, 19 years of taking off our shoes at airports after one guy set his foot on fire on a plane, pat downs, body scanners, no fly lists, brown people kicked off of planes, trillions of dollars spent, millions of people dead and yes torture look it was a disaster from start to finish but it was definitely a war blood and treasure were definitely expended and the american people definitely made sacrifices after 9 11 some of them sadly made the ultimate sacrifice now Fast forward to the present day, to 2020 and the coronavirus, we are now experiencing a 9-11 every day. On Wednesday, December the 9th, 2020, the single day death toll from COVID-19 exceeded the single day death toll from Tuesday, September the 11th, 2001, for the first time. But do you even remember what you were doing on Wednesday? Do you remember what the United States government did in response to Wednesday's 3,000 dead? Or Thursday's 3,000 dead. Well, start the clock. Actually, don't bother. Because I don't need 60 seconds to tell you what we've done to fight back against COVID since Wednesday. Because we've done nothing. Nothing. Donald Trump spent this week ranting about imaginary election fraud and ridiculous lawsuits. Congress went home last night still without agreeing to the most basic of COVID relief bills. And millions of Americans continue to refuse to wear a simple piece of cloth over their faces when they go out in public. No one is being asked to go fight and die in a foreign battlefield. No one is being detained without trial or tortured. 
Just stay indoors if you can and wear a mask outside if you can't. We can't do that much. We are in for the worst winter of our lifetimes. CDC Director Robert Redfield said on Thursday that, quote, probably for the next 60 to 90 days, we're going to have more deaths per day than we had at 9-11 or we had at Pearl Harbor. So I'm sorry to say we are at war and we all have a role to play. And look, I know it might not seem like a war because there are no Muslims to torture or Japanese to round up in camps. And the president is off tweeting about mail-in ballots. But there is a virus to defeat, an enemy, an invisible enemy, yes, that is nevertheless far deadlier than any terrorists that have ever attacked this country. And I, for one, will never forgive those who allowed 3,000 Americans to die, not just on one day in 2001, but day after day right now. Back after this. In 1980, a 30-year-old woman became head of construction for a Manhattan building that would soon become iconic, if not infamous. The woman was Barbara Rez, and the building? Trump Tower. Rez would spend 18 years in the Trump Organization with unlimited access to Donald J. Trump. And in her book, Tower of Lies, Rez describes a narcissistic but ultimately human boss who gave in to his worst tendencies as his fame and fortune grew. Self-aggrandizement, dishonesty, intolerance, and yes, racism. One incident that Rez says really shook her was when she was interviewing candidates for an open position. She writes, I saw a young African-American sitting in the lobby and I brought him into my office to interview him. Right after he left, someone came to tell me Trump wanted to see me. When I got to his office, he was livid. He stepped forward and closed the door behind me. I never ever want to see that again, he said. His face was red, which was not a good sign. What do you mean? I didn't even know what he was talking about. I don't want people thinking black people work here, he said. Don't you ever do that again. Barbara, I don't want black kids sitting in the lobby where people come to buy million dollar apartments. When the book was published in October, just before the election, the Trump campaign dismissed Rez as a disgruntled former employee packaging a bunch of lies in a book to make money. Rez left the Trump organization in 1998, but the president and his namesake group are now under scrutiny for alleged financial crimes, including a probe by Manhattan DA Cyrus Vance. He's now ratcheting up his investigation, according to the New York Times, a sign Trump could potentially face criminal charges once he's out of office. Joining me now to discuss how exposed Trump might be and why he won't let go of the presidency is former Trump Organization executive Barbara Rez. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, Barbara, you worked with Donald Trump firsthand for nearly two decades. You know about his ego, his need to win everything. How do you think this election defeat, especially this Supreme Court decision tonight, is affecting him? 
he's uh, it's killing him i mean there's no question about that i mean he, he can't he can't be a loser and he is absolutely defined and defining himself as a loser in this particular issue with all the fights that he put against um you know the, the different states and biden and he probably would have been better off if he just accepted it and he would have been at least a gracious loser now he looks like an idiot loser. um so I, th I think he's feeling bad about that. But um, I think that he's feeling worse about the fact that he lost because he expected to win. He thought he was going to win this, and he set it up so that he would win it. We, we don't talk about Russian interference, but they didn't go away, and I'm sure they were there. But this nonsense about the mail-in ballots and, and having uh, people where there was a county with half a million people in one place one single place to drop off their ballots in Texas. This manipulation of yes. the voting system that was all geared to get Trump in the office, and he expected it would happen. So he's angry about that, too. Right. Absolutely. That's a, that's a very good point, that, that the anger comes from how he thought he had set it up to win and uh, it didn't go his way. After demanding the FDA approve the Pfizer COVID vaccine, Trump tweeted this morning, Barbara, I just want to stop the world from killing itself. Meanwhile, we're in a pandemic that's cost nearly 300,000 American lives on his watch. What do you make of that bizarre tweet? Yeah, it's just another opportunity for him to try to make himself look like he is the one who has the good idea. He's the one with the big heart. He's the one that's got the people's interest. And it's just the opposite, but that's exactly what he does. He does just the opposite of what he says. He says just the opposite of what he does. Yeah. And I mentioned, uh, just moving on to the subject of his uh, alleged financial misdeeds and what might await him once he leaves office, uh, you've got a unique insight here because I mentioned the Cy Vance case in Manhattan. Uh, DA Vance is trying to obtain financial records from Trump and the Trump organization, from all the banks involved in it, uh, including eight years of Trump's tax returns. What do you think those records, those returns will reveal? And did you see anything that was questionable or outright illegal in your 18 years at the Trump organization? I saw Trump direct people to do things that were illegal uh, from a construction uh, code point of view, but not in terms of finances. Um, you know, we, we worked with, for the most part, uh, partners on the projects I worked on. So he couldn't really play with the finances much because they were being looked at um, by their partners. Um, but um, I do think that he probably did not declare all his taxes. He probably did not do the, the, the proper uh, calculations. And he did whatever he could to avoid paying taxes. Yeah. And he probably crossed that line. I'm sure he did. And would have. You know, I've seen yeah. him say to people, I don't do this, do that. And, and fully meant to break the law. And they didn't do it. Mm. I mean, his former personal lawyer, Michael Cohen, who I'm sure you know, has accused him of inflating and deflating his assets, depending on whether he needs a tax, tax break or a tax write-off or whether he needs insurance. Um, I had Michael Cohen on the show back in October. Uh, have a listen to what he said about his blind loyalty uh, to both of your former boss. I didn't leave the cult of Trump willingly. I was excommunicated, and I'm extremely thankful that that happened, because you're right, I would probably still be there. When he became president, again, I expected him to be better than what he was. That was my hope, and my hope was when I said things, why? for example, why? that... No, I don't understand why, Michael. When you, before he was president, he was trying to get the Central Park Five executed. He was birtherizing Barack Obama. It's not like he was some great guy before he became president, that you had some no, misguided he was, faith No, in. he was not. No, he was not. And again, I was, I was not just in the cult. I was high up and I was completely entrenched in it. You wrote in your book, Barbara, that you also saw people in the Trump organization become, quote, unrecognizable over time, that they drank the Kool-Aid, you say. Why do you think people fell into this so-called cult of Trump? And were you a member of it too? No, no, I was not a member of it. Uh, I can see that Trump is... Uh, uh, He's a manipulator. He's very, very charming, and he can bring people in to his uh, to his fold with with compliments and uh, and encouragement and that kind of thing, where they think 
that they're very important to him. And so they start building a bond. They start loving him, in a sense. And that's, the, that's sort of what goes on. They, they want to do. They reach a point where they want to do anything to make him happy. And that's what Cohen was saying, basically. He would have done anything for Trump. Yeah. But Barbara, you say you weren't in the cult, and you also write in your book about multiple instances where you saw his racism, his sexism, his xenophobia firsthand. So why did you continue working for him for as long as you did, 18 years? Why not say, I can't work for this man, and quit? Well, because, uh, you know, you have to put yourself back. Well, you don't have to put yourself back, at least as far as sexism is concerned. There's not a lot of people that hire women to, put, to do work in positions like mine. And I'm not saying that, so I'm not aggrandizing him by saying that. I'm just stating the fact of what it was from my point of view. Um, now, I worked in an industry that was filled with racists and sexists. So there was not, you know, it wasn't an alternative. My being there in that company, I think, was a positive for that very thing. I mean, you know, my, and of course he takes credit for it. So, I mean, you know, it's clearly a positive. Oh, I put Barbara Russ in charge of a building. And that is considered a positive thing. So, you know, I made a contribution in that way. Uh, I didn't leave him. I, I didn't go along with him. I didn't support his, some of his nonsense, like others did. And um, when he got too much for me, I quit. Yeah. So let me ask you this last question before I let you go. Uh, your former boss, Donald Trump, the president of the United States, who's now leaving office on January 20th, the Supreme Court has made sure of that. Um, he's talking about running again in 2024. Do you think he'll run again in 2024? Now, I'll quote myself, not a chance in hell. No, no, he's not going to run again. He's in <laughs> Why do you think that is? It's just such a preposterous notion. I mean, I realize that Biden is quite a long in years, but Trump will be that age, and, and that age for most people is too old to begin with. He's not in very great shape. Everyone knows that. But putting all that aside, he's not going to put himself in a position where he could lose again. That would kill him. That would mm. absolutely kill him. He's got to go out now, and he's got to try to pull back and recreate some of what he had. He's got a lot of followers and all of this nonsense about setting aside the, um, the, the, the legal election results. Much of it had to do with keeping his people energized and, you know, oh, I die for this, you know, that yes. kind of thing. Because he's going to use that when he's finished. It, yeah, it. it's a good point. No, I think, you, I think you make a valid point there, Barbara. Thank you so much, Barbara Rez, for your insights into Donald Trump. We appreciate you joining us tonight. One last thing before I go. There were bipartisan proposals in Congress this week to establish the National American Latino Museum and the American Women's History Museum. Both of them were blocked by a single senator, Republican Mike Lee of Utah. Why? Have a listen. So my objection to the creation of a new Smithsonian Museum or series of museums based on group identity, what Theodore Roosevelt called hyphenated Americanism, is not a matter of budgetary or legislative technicalities. It's a matter of national unity and cultural inclusion. But the last thing we need is to further divide an already divided nation with an array of segregated, separate but equal museums. Okay, that's not what separate but equal means at all. Honoring an American minority community is not the same as segregation, Mike Lee. And if you're truly worried about dividing the nation, please ask your boss, the president, to leave office in 40 days. That does it for me tonight. I'll see you back here on Monday night at 7 p.m. live right here on Peacock. Do please enjoy your weekend and stay safe. Good night.
Rudy Giuliani yesterday, earlier this week here, talking about ballots coming under tables, things that have been debunked by Georgia officials. Is there not a danger to bringing up those conspiracy theories that have been debunked already? Well, those aren't conspiracy theories. Those are real things that happened and they haven't been debunked.